Jeff, how are you, brother? I'm fine, Chris. How are you, sir? Yes, absolutely wonderful and great to speak to you on this anniversary, uh, 40th anniversary year of the Falklands, Jeff. Shocking. Yes, I'll just say before we begin, friends out there, if you know anybody else that um, would like to come on the on the show and tell their stories, individuals that are in the Falklands, I think it's really important that we get these documented. Um, we're all getting old. Some of these uh, gentlemen won't be around in, in maybe for the next uh, or the was it sent uh, fifth day. What's the 50th? <laughs> I'm yeah. going to say the 50th. I'm not going to get <laughs> clever clever with my Latin. But um, so, yes, please send us an email. And on that note, Jeff and I and um, John Mew, who was uh, on the sinking of the Coventry. We've got Captain Robert Lawrence, MC, who many of you will know fought in the Battle of Tumbledown. Uh, Nigel Spud Ely, who's been on the show a couple of times. Spud was two power at the Battle of Goose Green, uh, later went on to become SAS. And um, um, we've got a couple of to, to be confirms, so I'll say no more there. But just to say, we're going to be doing a talk evening and Q&A. The venue's to be confirmed. Time is going to be the sort of usual, probably 6 till 9 p.m. So look below the video uh, or stay tuned to my social media for details of how you can get a ticket. But what I would say is please don't mi miss what's going to be a, an emotional um, but also uh, monumental occasion and, and, and uh, one in which we can uh, also remember those that... that didn't come back. So, Jeff, my gosh, we met in a, a pub on a Barbican in Plymouth, didn't we? And you, you were holding a cardboard man. <laughs> <laughs> big Al. Yes, Big Al. Um, Sergeant Al Blackman, who, was, who at that time was in prison uh, for an incident that took place in Afghanistan. Yeah. And um, when I said to you, Jeff, Jeff, why are you doing this? You said, um, and by this, folks, I mean he was pushing for Al's uh, freedom. Uh, you said, because no one else is. Yeah. I, th I think the thing, Chris, was um, what I actually said was that uh, if it had happened to me or you, I would like to have thought that somebody like me or you would have picked up the baton and gone with it. Uh, that was much more initial thoughts. And I was just disgraced the way that the court was being portrayed on the television. Yeah. Um, and knowing the guys as I do, I thought that it just doesn't, doesn't sound right. It, doesn't, it didn't sit comfortable with me. So that's how I got involved to start off with. We won't say two more on this, Jeff, but just to say off the back of your efforts, um, uh, Al got his freedom and... Uh, and not not just your efforts, but off no. your initial efforts, it, it 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 then went on to involve a whole host of uh, supporters, many of whom made several trips at their own expense to London to um, petition the government, as it as it were. And uh, yeah, good effort, mate. Thanks. So, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about your Falklands experience. Um, how old were you when you when you joined the corps? Um, joined the corps at seventeen and a bit um, in um, uh, nineteen seventy January of nineteen seventy four. Very naive, um, you know. I, it was just when I joined the corps, it was that uh, I met some big bad people, and I thought, you know, it was quite intimidating when I first joined up. If I'm honest, but I got through the training which is the key. Um, and then when you join the unit, it's your first day of the real real job, if you like. Mm. Um, back in 74, that's when training was really easy, though. Is, is oh, it? yeah, it was really easy then. It basically just... Did there was, you no, health and, there was no, health and, no, no health and safety, Chris. It was just get on with it. <laughs> was, uh, was that Limston then? Yeah, well, I went to deal. 
Um, I was a junior Marine, um, and junior Marines used to go to deal for 20 weeks. Um, and they were taught how to clean the teeth, iron, and all the basic stuff of personal hygiene. We obviously um, didn't learn that lesson, mate, no, the, the ironing one. Well, I rubbed, I rubbed my hair off. That was the problem. Uh, but, no, it was, um, it was really tough. Um, quite, an, quite a sharp um, initiation, really. I remember arriving at Deal day one, and it was a bleak old day in January. And I, we got, got to the gate in our coach. And if you looked in, it was like a penal colony. colony. All these bald-headed lads with no hair on whatsoever, just sort of staring through the fence at girls and lining up at the bloody um, telephone box waiting to uh, phone home with their 10p. It was, it was a bleak old place deal to start off with, to be fair. It was a shock. I went to the barbers. I had long hair, believe it or not. And he said, what do you want? I said, just a little bit off the sides, mate. He went, Bzzz! gone, the lot, just fell on the floor. There was blokes just looking at the, uh, it was like a carpet of hair, just looking at that hair thinking, oh, my God. But I had it done, and it was such a mess. I went back and said, can do it again. And he took it completely right, not really similar to what it is now. And was 4-2 your first unit? No, I went, I went, I was really lucky. I, I went straight out to Malta, uh, for one commando. And um, that was like, uh, that was the plum draft at the time. Um, go out to Malta. Um, you know, the sunshine commandos, as they used to call us. Mm. So um, I, I plumbed for, um, did the training, went to Limston for the second part to do the commando so side of it. And then when I passed out, Went straight over to um, went straight over to Malta, which was a, again a shock. It's another story, really. But as soon as I arrived, the unit uh, had just deployed to the Cyprus war. We we'll call it a war. It was um, we went out there to protect the Greeks from the Turks as they come storming across. Uh, so literally, I went straight into active service. Gosh, and how? How old were you then, mate? I was 18 then. Mm. Um, and I could say, fit as a fiddle, um, but naive, really naive. Um, it was a massive shock. And um, as I looked around at these people who'd been in Malta for years and they were brown as a berry, and there was me like a milk bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Strange. Where were you when you first heard of the Falklands? Right. Well, we just come back from Norway. You know, people from the core will understand it. That um, every January we used to deploy to uh, Norway on the northern flank because there was always um, two ways that Russians were going to come and get us. One was through the plains of Germany. That's why there were so many people in Germany. But the Royal Marines' responsibility really was Norway um, and doing a role in defence from North Norway, trying to hold them back until the Americans could mobilise on NATO. Um, and we used to go every year. Uh, it, was a tough, it was tough, tough environment to fight in, as you know. Mm. You know. Minus 20, minus 30 at times, unbelievably cold. And especially the initial ones we went on, we weren't particularly well equipped for it. We, the first year we went out there, we went out with GS general, general stuff. No Arctic stuff whatsoever. Um, but I just come back from that, and I was on leave, um, and I was in a pub in, co in commentary. I went to visit my brother-in-law. I was having a having a pint, and um, I think I had a Royal Marine T-shirt on or something like that. And one of the guys come over and he goes, uh, "You know, you in the Marines?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Have you seen that?" I said, well, "Seen what?" He said, "The news." Obviously, you know, media was completely different then. Um, you had to get your phone with you and all that sort of stuff. So I went through into the bar and it was on the telly. And he had our guys like surrendering type stuff. And I thought, what the freaking hell's going on there? Mm. So I phoned back the camp and they went, we're trying to get hold of you. Recall, the whole unit's been re recalled. Get your ass back here now. Well, they'd had about half a dozen points. 
So I thought, I can't just jump in my car and drive down. So he goes home, tells the missus, I says, you stay here, I'm going back. She said, no, I'll come with you. I said, no, you stay here. So um, I drank copious amounts of coffee um, and jumped in the car. I drove straight down to Plymouth, uh, drove through the gates of Bickley, and it got a bollock in for being late, uh, gave me a hard time, and said, right, get your kits sorted, we're going. Um, so that was the first time I heard about it. And again, it was really strange because I spoke to a lot of guys about it and they all thought it was a, an April Fool bite. We just didn't believe they could have done it. Um, but they had. So we're all fired up then to go and get it back. Uh, that, yeah. was a, that was the first time I heard about it. Mm. And we should point out here, um, do you know, it, it wasn't a surrender, it was a ceasefire. No, that's true. I mean, yeah. they were told to lay the weapons down. Um, you know, the governor said, you know, there was no point. So he, he ordered us to, um, or the guys, to put their weapons down. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't surrender, no, you're right. No, he did. He, Rex Hunt had um, negotiated a ceasefire. I just, um, I think that will surprise a lot, a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people who've seen that I- iconic, iconic shot. Um, but yeah, so mate, you're off to war then, basically. Yeah. I was. Oh uh, yeah, I, I we travelled down to um, the unit had a couple of days to get ready, and um, I remember getting all the kit and kit musters and checking everything was right. And I said to her to my missus that uh, she'd come down and um, it was tears and all the rest of it. And off we went. But at, at 18, when I was 19, I was 24 at the time, uh, 82, yeah. And um, I was a corporal. And uh, actually, I want to mention this, I, was, uh, I, was, I wasn't supposed to go to the Falklands. Um, but being the irritating side I am, um, I went up to the officer, um, my company commander, and said, look, I want to go. He said, look, you're on a senior command course, and that's important in your life. I said, I don't care. I said, i got to go. Um, and if you speak to any of the guys that didn't go, you know where, where I come from. It was, it was hurtful. Um, and he weren't going to let me go. I said, well, put it this way. I ain't doing the seniors then. Um, I'd worked with those guys for a long, long time, getting prepared for something like this. And I was going to miss those. I said, nah, that's not happening. So um, eventually they got me off the course and I went. I got on the coach, all excited, all, you know, full of gusto and let's go and get them. And we travelled down to... uh, to Southampton, we arrived at the docks at Southampton, and there's this bleeding big liner there called the Canberra, big white thing. And they said, We thought we we're going on a warship, some description. I said, No, I get on there. I ain't going down on that. What a target. I said, You know, it's not even come down. Um, there was a couple of guys who'd gone to the advanced party, they met us. One of them was a good friend of mine. I can't remember his name now, but at the time he was a really good mate. And I, and I said to him, uh, make sure you get me decent grot. So uh, accommodation. Hmm. Well, it, we got marched onto the Canberra. Uh, we were just all like, look, big staircase and all that. Gets the accommodation. I had an absolutely busting room. It was beautiful. It was, it was better than some of the officers. Don't tell them that. Hmm. I've told him it now. It was massive. And I, I would never let anybody go in that room. There was two of us in this room. But it was a four-man room. And it was massive. Honestly, you could, you could have a party in there. And uh, I saw it. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I ain't going to war. I'm going on a bloody cruise. You know, it was a really strange situation. It's surreal, really. You know, I was brought up on Second World War movies and stuff. You didn't expect to get on a bloody big boat. With the uh, liner, uh, with carpet, and you know, it was just in, unbelievable. It was a beautiful ship as well. Anyone that's been on it, I'll tell you, it's absolutely beautiful. And they stuck us like on it, and there's some powers on there as well. And um, next thing you know, is we were sailing. Um, and the journey down was getting surreal because 
there was a lot of neg negotiations going on with Maggie Thatcher's government. And it didn't look like at one stage we were going to go in. America got involved. They were going to do their bit. And, um, you know, we just didn't know where we were. But what we did do is we trained every single day. We took advantage of that period because, you know, you know what it's like, Chris, in the core. I think you run around about 80% fitness level. And then you knock up that extra 20% when you go in for conflict because you couldn't stay at 100% all the time. Physically impossible. And we just spent 20, um, that extra 20% beasting ourselves. We used to run around the deck. I think it was a quarter of a mile all the way around. And we used to do four milers in the morning, four milers in the afternoon. We used to do bloody fitness tests. We'd, we'd do all the drills on all the weapons and everything else. We trained really, really hard all the way down. And I actually, again, a lot of people don't know this, but I injured myself. When I was in the South Atlantic, we were virtually there and we still carried on training. And we were running around the deck. I was running my troop around the deck. And unless you've done it, it's hard to explain, but it's something to be weight, weightlessness as the boat goes up and then comes down. It was going through these massive waves up and down and up and down. One minute you felt like you were nothing, there's no weight to you whatsoever. And then all that pressure come down on your leg. And I tweaked um, a tendon in the side of my knee. I thought, bloody hell, I did not hurt. Just like a snap, and, and I just left it. And um, I go back to the room, this massive room I had. And um, I said, look, to my mate, I said, look at that, look at that swelling on the side of my knee. He said, oh, God, he said, don't say nothing. I don't want to let you go ashore. I thought, oh, God, oh, I said, I can't bloody, I can't put no way on it. So I went to the doctor, and... Uh, he said, you, you, you stretch the tendon in the side of your knee. He said, there ain't no way you're going to short with that. I said, I've got to go. I'm the leader of my blokes. And he went, okay. He said, um, let's strap it up and see how we get on. So I, went, I didn't do any, any fizz for about the next three or four days, and it did calm down. But once I started, once, I, once we got ashore, he started playing me up again then. So I had wrap me, used to wrap my knee up in um, real tight bandages, uh, to keep going. So that was on, that was on the journey down there, Chris. To be fair, it was uh, it was just different. It was only it was only sort of two days out. They turned around and said, "You're going in." And then that really that was the business end of it. Then got really excited. Um, on the deck, um, ammo went up. Remember all the guys all sat around in circles. TQ come over, bunged a lot of. 7.62 in the middle of us and said, right, load your ammo, uh, load your weapons. And um, I think we used to carry, oh God, we used to carry six magazines, I think it was. We ended up on about 10. Um, and you're always like filling them bloody magazines with your thumb. <laughs> and no skin on there, then we thumb by the end of it. Um, getting all the uh, belt ammunition for the GPMGs. Uh, we came, a lot, uh, came out with a lot of grenades, and I think I took two L, L2, what they call L2, yeah, L, L2 grenades, a um, couple of white fuss, um, and a couple of smoke. And, I mean, you, you know how much kit you carry anyway, but by the time I'd put all this bleeding stuff in me, in me, in me Bergen, plus... Extra stuff I took as the section commander. Before I knew where I was, I had no room. Absolutely. I had a 66, and I had two more. We had two mortar um, shells each as well. Mm -hmm. And this is the gospel truth. I was a really strong lad. I could carry anything. I never had any problem with a fizz in the core. I couldn't lift my Bergen off the ground. And that's the gospel truth. I couldn't pick it up. And everybody was looking at me going, you wimp. I went, right, you come try and lift it then. And there's some bloody bodybuilders there. They could pump a lot of iron. And I'm going, freaking hell. Mm. So two guys lifted it up and stuck it on my back. And I was just bent forward like that. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I'm going to have to get rid of some of that. Um, but, you know, we did all the rehearsals, all the like the amphibious stuff, uh, this uh, disembarking. And... 
it was looking like, well, we knew it was war. We'd been really fired up. With, you know, we were quite bitter towards the Argies by the time we got down there. We thought they were out of order. And we were going to take the island back. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most dangerous things I did in the whole thing was climb down the on, on the day of the race, climb down the side of Canberra, sitting in the bleeding open, aircraft flying all over the place, attacking the bloody warships. If they'd hit, if they'd hit the Canberra, they'd have wiped out probably about a third of the fighting force. We're all sitting on our Bergens in the in the ballroom, waiting to go ashore. But when we actually, though, no, I've just jumped a bit forward there. You mentioned the Coventry earlier on, HMS Coventry. As we were coming on, as we were going off, the casualties from that ship were coming on. Imagine that, Chris. You know, you're all fired up, all calmed up, ready to go. And you're just ready to go down this, like, rope ladder. And they're bringing the casualties on. And these guys, they're burned, they're covered in oil. Big white bloody. I remember this one guy come up to me. A big white, them big white woolies that Matt Lowe used to wear, and he was he was in a right mess. And he come up. He didn't say it to me directly because we were in a group, and he just went, "Go get them for us, Royal." And I tell you, well, I could have flown off that ship. I was that bloody right. You, I'm going to have you. Um, and then trying to get down to the bloody landing craft down this bloody rope ladder with this Bergen on my back which I could hardly lift up. I couldn't lift it up. And I'm thinking I'm going to fall between the two boats there. It'll be a first casualty before we even get ashore. But everybody felt like that. It was so difficult. And we got to, when we got down near the, the landing crafts, they were going up and down on a swell like that. And you just had to catch it right and then just fall into the thing. And they all caught you. And we're all lined up in sticks ready to go ashore. And off we go. And uh, I've got visions of the Second World War. Ramps down, opposed landing, hit the beach, lads. Uh, so we're all so just dreading that off troops thing. And um, we go in and it's really rough. And then we go around the sand and we end up, I think we landed in um, San, San Carlos, T. Linley, I think it was called us or that. And we goes in and I'm, come on, guys, right? You make sure you bloody move fast, okay? Because if they're there, we want to be getting off there as quickly as possible. And they're all like, all their eyes are going and stuff, but down really low so that, you know, any rounds are going over the top, not hitting you. And the ramp went, uh, sorry, ramp didn't go there. And then all of a sudden, it pulled up alongside a jetty. And we all just got off like it was nothing. We're like, well, where the, where's the Argentinians? Well, they were all buggered off, mate. They've seen you lot come in and they've gone. So we were sure. Mm. Um, and so the first couple of days then was digging in, protecting the bridgehead getting as much kit ashore as we could, got everybody ashore, fighting patrols and that sort of, not fighting patrols, patrols going out wrecking, see if we could find any enemy. There was very little going on. The, the biggest threat was the aircraft. Again, people that didn't, people that did, I, I speak to people that a lot, as you know, um, with my mental health stuff. And a lot of people talk about Afghanistan, because obviously that's a, the most recent conflict. Um, and they never had air raid. And they don't understand it. You know, air red, air red, everyone take cover. And then you got some supersonic jet <laughs> straight past you. You're like, Jesus Christ. You know, you, you, I remember looking at two aircraft coming in and just like two little dots in the sky. And within seconds, they're over your head, gone, firing at you, firing missiles in your direction and that. It, it was quite, it's quite, um, quite interesting. But um, yeah, I say to people about that, I think once you're in a war, you know, initially every shot that's fired, every bang makes you jump. Oh, what was that? What was that? What was that? Um, but after about a period of, of about a week or so, I, I don't know how long it was, but there's it, it's a period where you're sanitised to it. Mm. So same, you speak to the guys in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, the initial, you know, it's like firework night, isn't it? Bang, 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 bang. That's why people stuff, uh, suffer with it. You know, I do myself. I don't like, I used to love fireworks. I, I don't like them now because I just go instantly back to that situation. 
Because they often, often I mean, I remember watching a war movie, and I think it was one of the Yanks, it was McCarthy, McCarthy or whatever. And there was, there was incoming. And he was just stood there. And it was like, you know, his bombs going off all over the place, and he's just stood there in front of his men. That way, men, and all that sort of stuff. But it was like that. You know, you just get to the situation where, as long as it don't hit you, you know, I'll keep moving. And I, I always explain this to people, because they go, oh, you're really brave. I said, no, you're not brave. This is how I used to say it, Chris. I don't know how you did when you were doing your bit, but I'm in a film, and I'm the film star, and the camera's on me, and I ain't going to get it. It don't happen to the hero. Don't get shot, does he? So that's how I used to look at it. It, it won't happen to me. And, and that, thank God it didn't. You know, but um, we were sure. Um, we, we, um, we dug in. And again, when you're, when you're actually digging a trench for real, you don't have to dig it a lot quicker <laughs> and a lot deeper. The only problem with the, with, with the ground was, one, it was so rocky. And we used to mind about, um, maybe we used to do our sending bridge, weren't it? I think we used to do uh, our digging in, thing in training. Nothing Mate, like I it. did mind it. Bloody Woodbury Common and uh, yeah, uh, you don't want to dig too many of them in nah. your life. It was tough, mate, honestly. And, you know, we were, we were still under fire. Um, we had a thousand pound bomb whiz over our head and landed on the ground. And typical Royal Marines, rather than take cover, they went and sat on it and took a photograph sitting on top of a thousand pound bomb that's just landed and, uh, a couple of yards from us. Um, so we all dug in. Um, and then we started, well, I think we got frustrated because we we're like, come on, let's go and get them. But we needed to get all the kit ashore. So all the kit came ashore then. Um, and then, am I right going on like this, Chris? Because I. Yeah, you know, mate, you're doing yeah. great. I just wanted to give a shout out, Jeff, because I think it's so only respectful is, is to the bloody civvies that were left behind on camera because that was their job. Their, their job was to work on a cruise ship. Yeah. The next, uh, I've just finished reading Tony Sycamore's incredible. Um, right, blow Tony. I know him well. Say again, mate. I know Tony really well. Yeah, he, he's him. he's put together this amalgamation of stories from Lima Company, which was my old um, company. Uh, seven years after the Falklands. Um, so a lot of the names in it, that, that a lot of the, well, some of the names in it were still in Lima Company yeah. when when I I served with Lima Company, and there's a there's a almost hilarious bit in it where um, Cameron March talks about Cameron was the sergeant major of Lima Company down there. Yeah, um, I never forget his famous in, infamous or famous quote when, when the camera came back into Southampton and all the you know all the glory and the ribbons and the bands playing and it was all the girls getting their boobs out and everything um the interviewer said so uh I'm here with um uh warrant officer Cameron March who who was the sergeant major of Lima Company in the Falklands Cameron, what do you have to say? <laughs> he said, um, he said, I've truly, truly seen my platoon grow up. I took down boys. I brought back men. And, but anyway, Cameron writes a bit in this, has done a bit for this, um, for Tony's book. And he said, he talked about how as you're all scrabbling to get ashore and everyone's grabbing grenades and, and, and all this kind of stuff. One of the um, stewards come up to him. And there's two stewards, I don't know, let's call them Peter and Paul. And Peter and Paul are boyfriend and boyfriend on, on the camera. <laughs> and they said, so, Cameron, what do, what do we do while you're ashore? He said, well, just man that GPMG. <laughs> and I, oh, how do we do that then? <laughs> so he's got to like, show them, <laughs> teach them web, weapons. And, he, and they left the crew to defend that ship. As civil, I mean, these guys are they're, yeah. they 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 work on a cruise ship. <laughs> they're supposed to be in Barbados, sipping bloody you know rum and cokes, and yet 
there they were down there. And um, there were some ladies on there as well, Chris. You know, mm, this <laughs> this. Uh, they had like a little boutique. I remember this really, really well. When we got down to Ascension, it was unbelievably hot. And uh, we're all getting a bit of sun tanning and stuff like that. And I went into the boutique thing and they had uh, sun, sun tan lotion on sale. We never used to have a lot of money, to be fair, but I got this luxurious sun tan cream. It was just amazing. And everybody kept profiting it off me. If someone were to grab it, somebody else had nicked it. And um, when we went ashore in, um, in um, Ascension, if you've ever been there, um, some of the people off the ship got to go go ashore as well. <clears throat> we went up, we went off and did a, um, I think it was a four mile speed march with full kit. It was absolutely knackery because running around the ship is completely different to running with all your kit on in like ninety degrees of heat or whatever it was. It was absolutely baking. Uh, and the Ascension Islands is like the moon. So if, if, I reckon if they did a film about the moon, they do it down there because it's, no, it's nothing. And in the middle, it's this beautiful, like, mountain that's all green, looks tropical. But the, the main gra- ground was um, really hard, uh, volcanic. It was horrible. And we ran around on that, absolutely knackered. And when we got to the end of it, it's a funny story, we all took our kit off. You know, we had bandanas on and all looking like Rambo and all the rest of it. We put our kit down and they said, right, before you go back on the ship, you can go for a swim. Whey! So all the kit come off. About 650 Marines running towards the water, diving in the water, swimming around. All of a sudden, I wasn't one of the first guys in. They all started running back out again. What's going on? Ah, 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 ah. All these roughy, tufty commandos and paras and stuff. Oh, ah! So what's the matter? They said, and I, I look at this one bloke, and on his arse, he's got a fish, and it's got it bit him, and stuck on his backside. And what it was when they were going in, there was this little black fish, only about that big. They weren't piranha or anything. I don't know what they are. Somebody to tell you who comes from Ascension. <laughs> But these big massive pools and they're like a cloud in the in the sea, and the, the sea was beautifully clear. And these clouds come in, and as soon as we ran in, they attacked us. They just only nipping you. They weren't like biting chunks out of you or anything. We all ran out. It was really <laughs> oh, God. If the Argentinians could see this, might think they'd be worried about anything, are they? But that was Ascension Islands. Mm. But, but they were. They were very brave. Um, on the way down the boat, they, they run little, um, they had a little uh, area that was theirs. <clears throat> and I remember going to the PRI sergeant, I can't remember his name, I think it might have been Clark or something like that, Nobby Clark. And he bought with him, believe it or not, the videos that you always bought, like Rambo and Full Metal Jacket and all that sort of stuff. But he'd also bought the unit, disco unit. And um, they were they were they, they were all talking, and I said, "I am these two civvies talking." And they said, "Oh, we're, we're having a drink tonight. We're, we're having a break." And oh, I thought, "Great." I said, "Do you want me to bring some music?" They went, "Would you?" I said, "Yeah, I think we've got a, a disco unit." So I went to see Nobby. I said, "Look, can I borrow the unit disco?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "It's only a little thing with two turntables on it, or whatever, um, with a lot of records." I think it might have been a, a CD deck, if I remember rightly. Not CD, a uh, cassette deck. Um, so I set this disco up, this little room where they had this gathering, it was the, uh, where, where they always went for a drink, and I played music for a more night. And I'm just trying to think what the, what the song was on the way down. It was, um, oh, God, what was it? Uh, Nick Haywood, the, the group he used to be in. Um, it was in, it was in anyway, and I put that on, and and every time I hear that now, I, I'm instantly trans, transmitted, uh, transported back to there. But they were great; they really were. <laughs> yeah, you got you got me thinking now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm uh, gonna, I'm gonna Google search it. Yeah. Um. So there you are. You've gone ashore because blokes getting their feet wet was a big part of the problem, was it not? Going ashore. Um. That and the ground, the, 
well, I'm not anti para I love them. I think what they did down there was terrific. But I remember we'd only been there about four days. And in fact, I met a guy the other day. There's two stories here. I, I met a guy uh, when I was ashore, uh, and I was um, unit MBC bloke, new kind of module chemical warfare instructor. And um, I had, besides everything else in my Bergen, I had um, extra MBC kit. And when we got ashore, I met, met this para, and he had trench foot, and he was really, really struggling. His feet were like twice the size they should be. They were an absolute mess. Um, and they wanted to vac him off, and he wouldn't go. He said, no, I'm not going. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the pain. And he asked me how I was getting on. And I said, I've got no problems. You know, we were very keen on foot care, in the, as you know, in the core. Um, but what I'd done, once we got ashore, because it was so wet, yeah, going ashore, we got wet. But the ground, you dug down a foot, it started filling up with water. All the trenches had six inches, sometimes a foot of water in the bottom of them. So the guy's feet was a, a right mess. And I gave this guy my MVC boots because they were waterproof. And he was like all over me. I thought he was going to start licking me here or something. He got all excited. And we, um, I say, we became friends to a degree before we all moved off into different directions. When I was in um, the Isle of Wight, um, not even three months ago, I was walking randomly and I bumped into the, the Isle of Wight hub, they call it, which the veterans have set up uh, for talking about things like we're talking today, really. And I said to this guy, I look, this guy said, come in. And I come in. He said, uh, you're military? I said, yeah, Jeff Williams, uh, Royal Marine. He goes, come in, come in for a couple of hours. I said, hang on. I said, I know you. I know your face. I can never remember a name, but I never forget a face. And I, I look, I'm looking at him and I go, I bloody know you. I said, did you have trench foot in the Falklands? Honestly, this is true. Because he probably he can respond to it because he knows me. And he goes, yeah, how did you know? I was going to say something sarcastic, like you all had bloody trench foot, but I didn't. I thought, no, I'll hold it back. I said, um, I gave you my, I gave a bloke just like you my um, NBC boots. He said, I can't believe it. He said, uh, it wasn't you. He said, it wasn't me. He said, it was my mate. He said, I was stood, I was stood about a yard from you when you did it. He said, you get, you go out your pack, didn't you? And he said, you take them, they'll sort your feet out. I said, yeah. He said, that's amazing. So it actually just randomly, by chance, bumped into this all the white hub, which is fantastic. We should be one in every city, to be fair. Um, but they look after the veterans well. And this guy would, had actually been there with me. So that was amazing, absolutely. But the feet was a, was a major, major problem. Mm -hmm. we, we had DMS boots. Oh, I think we just call them Dunlop Moulded Soles, I think they were called. They were absolutely rubbish. And uh, in one of my videos, I did seven videos myself about the Falklands recently. One of them I talk about the kit because they had better kit than we had. All their kit was all, all American stuff. Like the, the shirts that we eventually, when we got rid of the Angola shirts, we got these nice smooth um, cotton shirt type things. They had them. Mm -hmm. um, the boots were para boots. High length para boots, brown, very similar to what the guys wear now. Uh, they had them, and we had bloody DMS boots and putties, you know, from the Second World War. Mad, absolutely crazy. Yeah, it was insane. For friend friends at home, you had to buy a lot of your kit if you if if you wanted the creature comforts yeah. in the Marines, you had to buy your kit. So if you I mean, if you went to Norway, you bought a Norwegian army shirt. Yeah. Um, you bought as much Gore-Tex stuff as you you could get. You bought your own cooker. Yeah. Um, it looks quite insane looking back at it. How and, and it's and also to look at what what the guys are issued with today. And I'm sure today it's still backward compared to what oh, it could, could 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 be. Definitely. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, chest webbing, God, that was a godsend. In Norway, when you're carrying your, yeah. your Bergen, there wasn't really a comfortable way to have it sit on top of your fighting order. It just didn't work because the load carrying principle is you have your buckle around your waist to, to evenly distribute the weight. But when you've got your fighting order on, you've already got something around your waist. So a lot of blokes would just have the Bergen straps on here and carrying all that weight we did in Norway and the bloody tent sheet and the 84 millimeter, whatever it was. Um, so just something as simple as chest webbing was a amazing, amazing mm, bit. Yeah. So where did you progress from there then? You've got a shore. Well, we've got a shore. We, you know, we established the, be the beachhead and everyone's getting really frustrated now. And um, certain units had moved forward. I think the powers had moved. They went down towards Goose Green. Um, 40 Commando moved, 4-5 Commando moved, and we were still... We were still where we were. And then, um, I, again, another really good story. Um, we got Nick Bolts was getting really, really frustrated. Like I say, Nick Bolts was the best CO I ever worked under. And I had some really good COs. But Nick Bolts had the ability to remember every single man in his command virtually. He knew him, he knew the name. And I've never experienced that before. And he caught, he caught up, he said, oh, Corporal Williams, you're all right? Yeah, fine, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, as you guys, how so and so, how so and so. It was just amazing. And um, so it came down the line that we were moving. <clears throat> so we all got very, very excited. You know, one of my many jobs, I had loads of jobs. I was a, well, <clears throat> before the Falklands, we never used to have what they call a defence troop. We used to look after our own defence. But somebody caught with the idea that we'll have a defence troop for Commando HQ to make sure we don't get taken out. So I had 16 blokes. We used to double up on many, many different things. We, we used to run the LZM2, which is the landing zone marshalling team. We used to unload all the helicopters, we used to prepare all the, all the LZs and all the rest of it. And um, they decide that, that we're moving forward and we're going to move I'll call it a bunny hop, but it wasn't a bunny hop. It was a massive leap over uncharted ground to Mount Kent, um, which is the highest peak, I believe, in the Falklands Islands. And four two, we're going to establish themselves on top of that. <clears throat> so I get the briefing. CO gives everybody a brief on what they've got to do, and I've got to prepare the LZ to move K Company forward. So... All the moves, as you probably know, and all the battles, generally speaking, are at night. So I get the LZ sorted out, and all of a sudden I hear that helicopters in the distance, comes over the radio, that the helicopters, to, uh, Sea Kings are coming in to lift the guys. And a bloke called Mickey calls, sadly he's not very well at the moment. Um, he won the MM with Sharky Ward and Stevie Newland. Not for this particular engagement, but the next one. And Mick come up. Now, if you know Mick, he was an absolute character. A Yorkshire guy. Supported Sheffield Wednesday. Always winding you up. Constantly winding you up, this guy was. But lovely man. Great footballer as well. And uh, he comes over to me and he goes, where do you want us? I said, just stay here, Mick. Um, just get your guys briefed. As soon as, it, as soon as the aircraft comes, I'll march you onto the, the aircraft. So we're all calmed out, all lying down really low. The helicopter's just one light on the bottom, but you can hear the rotors going really eerie, ready to go, very quiet. Helicopter comes in, lands. I run up to the to the guy on the on the door, loadmaster, whatever he's called. I said, right, I said, uh, I've got a stick of uh, raw marines for you. Right, okay, no problem. Go back bring him in. So I grab hold of Mick. Right, Mick, follow me. <clears throat> put them all on there. Put them all on. No Bergens, just fight in order. And they get, on, they get on the helicopter. And the tension, you can, you know, it's just like we're going, you know, the, 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 at the end of this journey, they're going to be there and we're going to have to fight for our lives. So they're all, and again, you know, they're all young kids. 
18, 19, you know, you know what the fighting companies are like, 18, 19, 20 year olds. Mick was about, well, Mick was about my age, about 24, 25. He had a big walrus moustache. Used to make me laugh, especially in Norway, it used to freeze it. <laughs> big, like, white, massive thing on his face. But he, he was he was calmed down. It was really serious, and I could I could tend, I could sense he was really nervous. But he was I mean he was a warrior. He was a great bloke. Mm. If you want to fight, you want me next year. So anyway, they get on the helicopter. Another bloke I want to mention was Jack Parnell. So Jack became one of my Marines later on in uh, later on in his career, and um, he reminded me of it. Actually, I don't remember, but I sort of as I went to close the door, feeling really bad, I wasn't going with him. He turned around, I'll turn around to more and I went, go on, lads, we can give them one for us. Go on, get in there, come on. Mm. And really sort of winding them up. And I slammed the door and off they went. And that was it. Um, and they were on the radio, contact, contact, wait out. I thought, oh, bloody hell, what's happened? Um, the SAS had gone in before them and they were having a contact on the on the, Mount um, Kent. So they had to turn him around because the helicopter weren't safe to land and bring him back. So the next thing I'll run back out again, brings the helicopter in, offloads them all, Mick's laughing his head off. <laughs> you can't believe it, he said. Wouldn't let us land. So pull them all back off. And next thing I know from the CO is um, not from of the radio, pass bone for 24 hours, we'll do it tomorrow. So we had 24 hours to sleep on it, and then we went to the same exercise again. And the guys moved to um, that the, 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 the next night they went and they got ashore. So they, they, they got on the on the hill. That, there was still some enemy uh, resistance. There was bodies, several bodies from the Argentinians around. There was a sniper the guys used to talk about that they took out. <clears throat> and they moved up the hill, mountain, got to the top. Well, Chris, you know, I'm not prone to exaggeration, but the weather conditions on the top of Mount Kent were the worst I've ever experienced. It was peeing down a the rain. There was sleep mixed in it. And this like 60, 70, probably 80 mile an hour wind. It was just unbelievable. Uh, and K Company <clears throat> was stuck on the top. And uh, next day they said, <clears throat> right, we secured, we secured the top. We'll bring the rest of the commando forward. So they started moving everybody forward. <clears throat> when we got there, I, I was greeted with the most shocking sight I've ever seen in my life. Um, I've never seen guys in the core store, but they were struggling. They'd only been there 24 hours. Absolutely soaking wet. That's my dog, by the way. Fru fru freezing to death. No kit. They're trying to... They're trying to get themselves into the crevices of the little rocks that were the rocks that were at the top of the mountain and just trying to keep warm. Used to wrap um, you remember the old um Kagul things used to have. Uh, that was your that was your that was your shelter. They just mucked that round them and they were just like that, shaking like mad, freezing to death. And I looked at them and they were just like, God, this is ridiculous. Anyway. <clears throat> Because it was so bad, the helicopters couldn't fly to the top of the mountain and didn't fly at all. Um, they had no food. They had no, well, we had plenty of water. Um, but they were in a mess. Mm -hmm. So I remember Nick Box, it was famous. I've read it somewhere. I can't remember where I read it, Chris. But Nick Box said, <clears throat> get my guys off the top of this mountain. Or we ain't gonna be in no fit state of fight. Now, for him to say that, that gives you a measure of what it was like. It was absolutely horrendous. Everybody, so, go on. Jeff, can we just clarify? Have, have have they fought the battle? Well, there wasn't. The battle had been take, taken place really the day before, and and, and the um, Argentinians were either dead or had bogged out. So they've done the sort of follow up. Yeah, it was all it was all secured. You know, we we secured the area, and then and then they moved the rest of the commando forward, and they were greeted by this really horrendous weather. Mm. Uh, they stayed on the top there for um, a couple of days, and then 
the message comes down to me. Um, you need to go back. Why? You, you need to go back and get the BV202s, which are the over snow vehicles, because they were the only kit we had with the radio comms in that wasn't carried. All the, all the heavy stuff was in the back of these. The SF kits were on the top and all the rest of it. Um, so we went back. So I had to get my guys together and we had to patrol back to um, Teal Inlet. And, and you imagine this, right? You're going across ground at night. It's not been cleared. So I, I'm like, what? You're not going to fly us back? Oh, no, I'm not going to fly you back. You're going to walk back. Well, oh, brilliant. So they give me the grid references in the maps and I checked them all out. And they said, take, take your, uh, we're going to need six guys who can drive a BV to bring the BVs back. So um, took my briefing. Both of the guys said, right, we're going to have to go back. Oh, you know, my fault. Go on back and get the BVs. So we, we patrol back. Now, because uh, we didn't know if there's any enemy positions there. We didn't know. We, we, we hadn't got air superiority at the time, so we could be hit by aircraft. And we could go through minefields. We didn't know. So imagine that sort of thrown in your plate. You've got to get them vehicles back here because we need them vehicles now. We are struggling. So we went back. It took forever. Every step was a potential disaster. And we got back. And... Um, we got the BV two two or twos, and they're all ready. And they're only the, the top rack on a BV two or two is only designed for skis. We had absolutely tons of stuff on it, which actually affected the vehicle's um, um, ability to do its job. We had SF kits on the back, you know, heavy they are. We had ammo. We had food. We had right, we had um, Bergens for the guys that were up there. We tied them on everywhere. I remember seeing this video, if you remember it quite well, I imagine, when they went back to get that guy that was been left behind with the core when they strapped themselves to the um, Apaches. It was like that, honestly. There was not an inch of room on them vehicles. Even in the cab, which used to um, flip, flip open from the top. Now, this guy... Lieutenant, I got it wrong in my video. I called him Spencer. His name was Lieutenant Spicer. He was a 2IC, I think, of somebody or other. He, he took us back up there. And this convoy of vehicles drove the same, virtually the same way we walked, not quite. And we, we started driving back. And again, under threat of minefields, under the threat of enemy positions, under the threat of air crash, it hadn't been cleared. Because we just we just flown straight over the top of it, and off we went. But this was in the day, and we moved very tactically and very very slowly. Everybody was stood up. I was driving it, stood up in the driver's seat with a hatch open, ready to bump, jump out. Should the, should the worst thing happen, Lieutenant Spicer was doing the same. The vehicle behind had a GPMG mounted on the top, so he was stood up all the time looking for aircraft and any enemy positions. And we moved very, very slowly. Anyway, eventually, we come to a lake. And I couldn't see the other side of it, if I remember rightly. I remember thinking, and I'm a fisherman, so I, I love water. And I look at this lake, and I'm thinking, the tracks go in like a ford. And right on the other side, which I couldn't see, they come out. And I thought, that can't be right. It looked about 10, 15 feet deep. And as you know, BV202 doesn't float even though a couple of Marines have tried it. And um, we started going across this lake, excuse me, and um, every, well, for, to start off with, I was arguing with him, sir, we need to go around this. And he's saying, no, it definitely says it's a Ford, you'll be able to go across it. And I wasn't convinced. And I drive those vehicles a lot. I even saw one sink in a field in Norway once, Tony Vidler. Uh, was, was going across and it went under and they called him Captain Nemo after that because he sunk the he sunk his BV so I didn't want to be called Captain Nemo too so I didn't want to go to go across him honest um, but eventually he said no we're going for it 
So off we went, just, just in one vehicle. And I've never experienced it my whole life again. All the way across, Chris, it was 18 inches deep maximum. Every second, I kept expecting a ledge and whoosh, we're going to go. No, we went all the way across. And then we summoned the other vehicles across. And then we made our way to the bottom of Mount Kent. Well, that was horrendous getting up there because got rock runs. And the BVs, 202s, do not go over rock because the shear pins go and they're useless. So I got out. There's a bloke in charge, really, from the, you know, from the MT side of things. And I made a way up there, found my way, and come back and said, right, I found a way. Again, we were totally exposed the whole time. And eventually, we drove them to the top of the mountain. The relief of the CO and everybody was just unbelievable. They had, they had some cover. They could put the CPs, the command post together. They come them all out. And they actually had some shelter. Because, again, on the BVs were the CPs or the tentage that we used to have. Um, and I'm not saying it saved a day. God, of course, it never. But what a relief. And, you know, the likes of Davy Rubb, who was one of the youngest Marines that was there at the time, who I met later on in my life, um, he's internal, eternally grateful for some food and his burger, and they could actually put some sort of shelters up. Um, and that was Mount Kent. So that was horrendous. And then eventually the CO said, get me off here. Later on, we captured an Argentinian. And when we were debriefing him, he said to us, he could not believe that a commander unit of 650 men were on the top of Mount Kent. Because apparently the Argentinians tried it. The weather conditions were so extreme that they um, decided to go into the valleys instead. And the Argentinians used to bomb uh, artillery rounds, nuisance rounds, all around the valleys trying to hit us. And we were sat on the top of Mount Kent. They just didn't believe you could survive up there. So, again, that's a massive accolade to the guys and the quality of the guy for what they did endure up there. Because I can tell you now, first thing, and experience, it's absolutely horrendous. So that was Mount Kent. Um, and then from there, um, first and foremost, the fighting companies moved away um, to secure or getting in, in a position to be able to take on Mount Harriet which was the major battle for 4 2, to be fair. And um, once the units move, once the, the companies move forward, Commando HQ was really exposed. Um, and I remember going across there with the two IC uh, and the map kit that the guys had left behind. Because by that stage, there was, there was stuff in your Bergen which was just weighing you down. And all you wanted to carry was ammo. That's all you wanted. You didn't want all the rest of the luxuries. <laughs> Not luxuries, are they? But they are luxuries when you ain't got them. And um, it was so much kick lying around. I thought, God almighty, guys, you know, you get into another situation where you've got to wait for a while, you're going to be knackered. But I uh, collected a lot of that stuff up, put it in bags and stuff, and uh, we kept it. Um. And then another interesting story, when we were really exposed, like I say, the guys had gone. So we were defending, the, my, my team of 16 were defending the uh, Commando HQ. <laughs> and again, you know, I don't make myself out to be any sort of hero or anything like that, but it was, um, I'm just trying to think now, it was about, I don't know what the temperature was, but it was, it was late at night anyway. And a message come from the CEO, and he, he said, uh, Cooper Williams, um, it's just come out of the radio. Um, the SAS have just spotted one of their OPs, have just spotted um, Argentinian Special Forces boarding a, a, an air, two aircrafts, and they're heading in our direction. And, he, and the guy that come to tell me, Colonel Sergeant, he was panicking. We've got all the guys have gone, and there's us and Commando HQ on the top of the bloody massive mountain. And their special forces are going to do a counterattack. 
and they're coming down the valley in the helicopter and you need to get the guys mobilised now. So we, right, we, we were just getting our heads down. So what I was going to say to you earlier was we used to work 20-hour days. You slept when you could. You know, sometimes you didn't sleep at all. I, I, I even um, had the art of sleeping while I was stood up. That's how ridiculous it was. So every bit of sleep, sleep we got was fantastic. And um, sleeping away, and I just got my head down. I said, these colours aren't come over. Get the guys mobilised, the, their sass or whatever they were, were coming in our direction. So you imagine the panic. So I went around all the guys, come on, come on, get, 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 What do we need to take? No orders, no sort of NATO set, set of order, anything like that. Follow me. We'll, I'll talk about it as we move. Grab every bit of ammo you got. So anyway, what we decided to do was set up a snap ambush because there was only one way that they could come up that mountain. Um, in my humble opinion, and that was the, the opinion held by everybody. It was a steep, it was a steep bit, but a well-trained group of men could get up there quite easily. So I set the ambush there, and um, I got them all in position, and the guys are like, God. Anyway, all of a sudden, I start hearing this noise. I thought, here they come. Oh, God. Happy days. Tension was unbelievable. It was snowing. I looked at the bloke to my right. You know how an ambush goes. You have everyone in a straight line. And I had the gun right, I had the um, two PMG right next to me. And we all could touch each other and pass the message down the line, whatever. Oh, so many blokes that size and so many blokes that size. And uh, we hear this noise. Pitch black. I just hear this noise. And uh, heart starts beating like, I said, right. Safety catches off. Safety catches come off. Looking down, Stewie can't see, can't see him. I just hear this bloody noise. All of a sudden, this thing broke, broke into view. It's a flipping sheep. And everybody went, oh, thank God for that. And then we heard another noise, but this was definitely a human, and he was running, and it was to our right, and slightly, slightly down. So we all get back into position. And uh, I hear, Corporal Williams, Corporal Williams, where are you? It's a colour sergeant. He's got it off the radio that they weren't coming to us now, that they changed direction and weren't heading towards us, but he didn't know where we were. So he almost walked right in front of us all, and we nearly all shot him. And because he went, Corporal Williams. So um, we all wound him up about that afterwards. We all went back relieved, and, and that was that. And then before we knew where we were, you know, we were, we were uh, moving again. So that's another little story, but uh, could have gone terribly wrong, terribly wrong. It's just insane to think. I mean, just to be in Norway, you're utterly freezing and exhausted, and you're not even, like, wet or anything, and you've got, those Norway ration packs that got double the calories and there's always plenty of them knocking around and, um, you know, your color sergeants bringing you out bloody cans of Coke and little treats and stuff or the Norwegians are giving you something. And, and that in itself is still one of the hardest things that I ever did. Um, I can't, it's just impossible to, imagine what what you guys experience it it it's like the complete opposite of an I, ib for holiday isn't it yeah <laughs> in every sense was, of the word i mean the, the thing chris even though it was that bad you know when we i core ethos and that you know we talk about uh, smiling in the face of adversity and all the rest of it they did they still took the piss out of each other they still wound each other up, bites left, right and centre, you know, um, just anything to keep your mind off what was going on. Um, you know, buddy, buddy, checking each other over, people borrowing people's stuff, people who had some food, sharing it with other people. You know, it was just all that the Corps is about, all that the British forces are about, 
was on display there in abundance mm. all the time. And you don't realise at the time because it's a survival situation. But, uh, you know, you've you got to give um, kudos where it's de uh, deserved. It was just amazing how, how they survived that. Um, and then we're fit enough to fight, you know, mm. before you know where you are, they're on the way up Mount Kent, uh, sorry, up Mount Harriet. Um, and then, and then vi virtually after that, uh, the signal came that um, the Argentinians, uh, the old white flags are flying over. Stanley signal came out, and we all looked at each other and went, "Is that that? Is it finished?" But yeah, they, they give up. Just what. Jeff, just going back to Mount, Mount Kent. So, w w were there Argentine bodies lying everywhere? Right. Well, yeah. Um, well, well, there weren't many. I mean. I Again, I have got massive blanks in my memory. I think I, I spent I spent a long time suppressing it, but there were bodies, and oh, I can't remember the RSM name. Sorry, it's gone. I can see his face now. He, um, one of the working um, tasks, um, working parties that we had um, was he wanted. Um, the Argentinian bodies collected because there were several of them on the, still on the slope. So we went down and we found them. When we found them, um, we wrapped them up in a like a sheet type thing. Um, and we took them up to the top uh, where we were. And I remember, I, I remember three, but it was more than that. And the RSM come up and he said, um, bury him. What? Oh, bury him. Well, honestly, there was two inches of soil and then it was rock and he wanted them buried. So I uh, started, uh, I got the guys, I said, right, come, let's see what we can do. <clears throat> clonk, clonk, nothing. So we took the topsoil off and then I got them to go out and get rocks and and build like rocks all the way around them <clears throat> and then on top of them because at some stage they were going to be removed and i <clears throat> actually i thought about this the other day i don't remember how they were removed they were definitely removed but certainly we never did it um but we put them in a place padre said a prayer over them treated them with the greatest respect as warriors do um so we put these stones. Anyway, the RSM come over with his sense of humour and uh, he said, um, I told you to, um, I, want a, I want an honourable bury, uh, bur burial. He said, do you call that honourable? I said, sir, we've been eight hours collecting every rock off this hill. You could go 80 metres that way, 80 metres that way, and there ain't a rock. We picked every single one of them up and placed them on these on these guys to give them some cover. And he said, well, I said a proper burial. And he puts a smirk on his face and he produces this rock from behind his back and he places it on the top and he goes, no, that's an honourable burial. burial. Yeah, but that, that's just the core in it. You know, that's what, that's what it's all about. But there were bodies around and I, I hadn't, um, I hadn't seen a, a dead body um, I can remember previous to that they'd been killed in com combat um, and this one guy had been shot in the neck I think it was here and it took you know what the 7.62s like goes in and it just takes everything with it and um, he was a mess to be honest with you but he died instantly you could see just that the thing that got me was the shock on his face like and that that, that haunts me sometimes when I look at that I can see it in my head um but um, no, they were treated with the greatest respect. Um, gathered them all together, and then they were taken away. I suppose, but uh, I, I never, I never saw them uh, again. Um, that was that. It was sad. But yeah, I'm just trying to build the picture here for our friends watching or listening. Is that you know, there's these young commandos there, and that it's not just surviving the elements and the starvation and the and the drinking out of 
filthy puddles. It's you've got bodies lying around you for you that, and, and you're not probably either a teenager or not long out your teens. It's wow. it's a it's a big old thing. I, I spoke to people, Chris, that and again, you know, when people think about war, you all got different impi- opinions of it um, and impressions. But these 18, 19, 20 year old guys, you know, they were involved in hand to hand combat. When was the last time we were involved in hand to hand combat? You know, you got um, the Matt Harriet um, attack, it, it is, again, this is my version of it. The books are slightly different, and everyone's got a different opinion on it. But the guys I spoke to, I didn't go up Matt Harriet on the actual assault, but this is, this is my story. Um, the guys, we got the briefing, and, and there's a famous picture of Nick Fox giving his um, commando um, set of orders on the top of my tent for the Harriet attack. Now, I was actually there, and again, I don't know how I didn't get in the photograph because I was there um, listening to it, and um, he, briefed, he briefed the company commanders what he wanted from them and everything else. And off, off they went. And um, when the guys got down to the start line, they started moving up this mountain. It was horrendously high. I say it was difficult terrain. There was not a lot of cover. And the guys just went up in their fighting order and as much ammo as they could possibly carry. Didn't take anything else with them. And they start crawling up this hill. Pitch black, nothing. The only noise there was, was the support in gunfire from Glamorgan, I think it was. It was putting nail gunfire onto the top of the hill. But they did that every day. So it was no obvious that we were coming because they did it every night. And that's uh, to soften them up. But they were really well entrenched in good, good positions. They had all the angles covered and everything. And the guys started crawling up it. And um, this is Mick Eggles' his story, because I spoke to Mick about it, and he won the MM. And they were crawling up and crawling up and crawling up. Now, bear in mind, there's a lot of guys moving up that hill. And do you know what? They never spotted them. So they were within about 20 metres of their front trenches. And imagine their shock, because they ain't all stood too. They're all in their trenches having a cup of tea and all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, a flare went up, boom, somebody spotted one of the guys. And the whole of the mountain was illuminated. And there were 600 odd boot necks, cammed out. Mm-hmm. You know, you see the films about Vietnam when, you know, a load of gooks attacked the wire. It was like that. Like, Wasn't it, um, well, didn't the Marine from... Lima Company stand on a stand two, on. two guys stood on a landmine. Uh, two guys lost their legs, uh, the feet, if I remember. They didn't lose their legs, they just lost their feet because I remember them coming to a parade when we got back. But um, I was like, they were almost on top, the guys were almost on top of them, and then it all held um, rope loose. And as, as I said to you the other day, there was two anti anti aircraft guns on the top of. Um, Harriet, they switched them around and started firing them at the guys. And the amount of volume of fire that came down, the whole commando group, the, the whole attack, the, the um, momentum of the attack stopped. Was it Babington, K Company commander? He said to the guys, "Get you, you, you've got to get it moving again. So Mick jumped up, Stevie Newland and Sharky Ward, all three of them, and charged their front positions. Unbelievably bright. There was rounds going off everywhere. We took the machine gun out. Um, Mick ran off, apparently. And all these guys were like, where's he going? <laughs> he, was, he just ran straight towards them. Unbelievably brave. I got the military medal for it and well deserved too. And then the fighting continued and it was trench for trench, trench for trench. Now, what the Argentinians used to do was, was the conscripts used to be in the front trenches and their better troops, their, their seasoned troops, used to be behind them. So you'd think you were through it 
and then all of a sudden some real good hacker at fire come in. Exactly what happened with uh, Colonel H. Jones of the Paris, who got the VC. I think that's how they got him, was they broke through the lines, they were through into their position, and then they got hit by trenches on the side, and he was killed, sadly. Uh, and that, that happened to us. There was rounds going everywhere. Um, but when they surrendered, this was really strange. Because I always talk about, you know, you know, you know about military tactics, Chris. Um, we work to a three-to-one ratio. It needs to be a three-to-one advantage to us in the book, if you follow the book. If that had been the case, we well, one, we couldn't have done it because we haven't got the numbers. But... When we got to Mount Harrier, when they started surrendering, there was more than that. There was more of them than there was us, and they surrendered. And we, because it was dark, they couldn't tell. But if they'd known how many of us there was, I reckon they'd have got back in the trench and carried on fighting. Mm. Um, and it's like the Paris story when you when you talk about Goose Green. They too, I see, bluffed them into surrendering. Yes, she spoke to them and said. Are you going to surrender, guys? Because you know, knowing fair well, they'd taken a pasty. They had a lot of casualties. But he talked to me into surrendering because the, the will wasn't really there, I don't think. We were just totally insane about it. We were going to take the Falklands Islands back, whatever cost. I think they'd been there and they were, what we're doing here, type mentality. Um, and our professionalism... And the standard of troops that we had on the ground, so the powers were fantastic. The Corps, you know, I don't think the Corps made enough of, enough of it, to be fair, what they did, because I know a generation of people joined the Royal Marines and the British forces because of what happened in the Falklands. Um, and then I'd say that was it, really, Chris. It was it was index, finished. Jeff, but, where, where were the companies spread out when, when, um, when they took Harriet? Can you just I, give us? I, I can't, if I'm brutally honest with you, I'll say there was K Company, there was L Company, and there was J Company. Mm. So the three companies moving up the hill, if I remember right, it was one company in front and two companies side by side, and, and they went up that way. I'm not 100% sure. M, one of them. M Company? Well, weren't they in, um, again, I'm, I'm showing my ignorance. Um, one of the companies went to um, South Georgia. Um, so they went out to sort that out um, and we were left one company short but, but I'd never this was really strange as well J Company didn't I didn't even know who J Company were to be fair we never had a J Company it was always KL and M um, and they formed J, J Company out of HQ ranks um, so one of the companies went over to South Georgia to liberate that and the rest stayed with the rest of the task force on the, on the Falklands. Wow. But it, it was, you know, the numbers we had, it was an unbelievable feat. It, 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 it shouldn't have been, it shouldn't have been possible. I mean, they were dug in, you know, they were, they were um, prepared. They had minefields set out. They could channel us to where they wanted us to be. But because I've never, um, I've never forgot it. Oh, it. It lives with me on a, I wouldn't say a daily basis, but I think about it a lot. And I think, God, you know, he's so lucky um, to survive it. And it could have gone either way. I mean, if they'd really give us a battery in there, um, they might have had to bring reinforcements down or whatever from UK, who knows. But the guys that were there did, did a fantastic job. Yes, here, here. They certainly did. I mean, it's... Um... It's just, there's no words for any of it, Jeff, are there really? The, 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 whole, the whole scenario, the sailing 8,000 miles with a, you know, a Navy that was on its way out and um, grabbing the kit, the fact that most of the helicopters or the heavy lifting helicopters sunk, that there was such terrible, uh, you know, the Welsh Guard suffered terribly yeah. when Ge Sir Galahad went down and that, um, the terrain in basically World War II kit, um, 
it's just it's all it's all so it's just it's beyond belief and i i'm i almost feel like i'm privy to some part of it through being in the core if you know what i mean you know i can sense a sense a lot of the stuff um in fact i read a book years ago god i've got to try and not get upset here but it 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 was a chap's account i can't remember it's not one of the ones that 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 sort of springs to everyone's mind but it was chap wrote this book and he said when they he said when they came back into southampton i'm guessing it might have been another ship but let's just say it was on the camera back into southampton he said he was on like one of the mess decks having an early morning ciggy with with his mate and he said he couldn't believe it suddenly all these boats started like rocking up I feel like and 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 then more and more and more and and it become this extravaganza and then as they got into port there's just the last line of his book is i i was there but more importantly than that i i was a royal marine yeah it was really emotional chris i mean we you know what it's like when you come back from anything normally it's just get back to camp they, they, to get, get all the kit put away and then off on leave. It wasn't like that. Um, I didn't expect my family to be there. My family was there. I was in bits. My children were there with two little daughters. And um, they came up. They'd been given a rose and she come up. Angela, she was the oldest one. Only about, I think she was about six or something like that. And do you know what? And this sounds really uh, mean of me, but I couldn't think about them while I was doing it. And when I saw them, it all come gushing out. And uh, she come up, Daddy, and hugging her. It was just, you know, what, what, what's all these people doing here? You know, get us on the coaches and get us back. Um, and even, the, you know, so my dad was there. My dad was just so proud because I did a video the other day as well about the aftermath and, and what they went through, the families you know, you didn't like now all that information they had was from the news and half of that was rubbish because there was no news reporters up with us we wouldn't let them come with us it's too dangerous, that's why there's no footage of actual fighting mm. you notice, there's none, there's none, it don't exist because we wouldn't let them come with us one because we didn't want the responsibility. The two, you know, it's no for a camera when the shit's hitting the fan and people are dying and screaming out. You know, I'll never forget the people that died. I'll never forget the people that were injured. Their lives altered forever and ever. But so, you know, the drive back from Southampton was just, it was like, I don't know, everywhere we went, there was people. Thousands of people lining the roads, waving Union Jacks. I was, I was there. Yeah, oh, it's just amazing. Don't, don't ask me how, Jeff, but for, for some fluke, we were driving back from some family holiday. Yeah, and God, I can remember just driving along, and we would have been about twelve at the time, and in the back of every car back front w w was a serviceman that the family had been to pick him up and as kids you were just waving yeah and they were waving back these heroes were waving back to you yeah. i mean every light every lights we turned we, we stopped at people were throwing beer in the crates of beer in it was just incredible I, I, another little story because you know I'm, I'm very dramatic mate but um, I do think deeply and um, we were I don't know where we were we're on the way back it was on the south it was on the south coast road anyway to Plymouth and um, we're in the coach and I was about three quarters of the way back something my dad telling him about it stuff like that and his arm around me 
And we stopped at these lights. And I looked up right, I believe in destiny, by the way, but I looked to my left, literally in line with me, was an old lady in a wheelchair. And her garden was elevated. And somebody had pushed her out and sat her there so she could wave to the boys coming back. And I looked at her, and she had a big smile on, like a nan. <laughs> and uh, I got it. I said, "Whoa, hold the bus!" Said, what do you mean? I said, hold the bus. I got out the. I got out the bus. This is gospel truth. And if a family are around, I'll tell you it's true. I climb. I am sailed up a garden, and I give him a green berry, and I stuck it on her head, give her a kiss. She said, oh, you're so wonderful. Got back in the coach and off I went. So that, that was my little bit. I'm home. Done it. Got, got, got through it. And there you are, love. Thank you for having the, you know, because we never got that in the call. Nobody ever thanks you for the shit, the shit that we do. <clears throat> it, it doesn't happen. It's just, I mean, I had people say to me, well, that's what, that's what you paid, paid for. I said, you joking, mate? I think it was £120 a week, or whatever it was, fighting the bloody uh, Argentinians because they decided to infiltrate one of our bits of land. You know, the Falkland Island people didn't deserve that. Um, but we got back, and say so when we got back, we're all heroes. But I remember um, my mum and dad did a dinner for me. We weren't into the big welcome home, Jeff. See, you know, on, on, we didn't do that sort of stuff in our family. But our mum, I spoke to my mum about it, and she said, the, you know, the effects of that still live with her today because she didn't know what I was up to. And I had two other brothers that were serving. I had two brothers in the light infantry, and um, they were both in Ireland at the same time. So they were in Ireland, and I was over in the Falklands, and she was scared to answer the door, scared to answer the phone, she never watched the news because as soon as she went to work, everybody used to ram it down her throat. What's Jeff? Was Jeff there? Was Jeff? Did Jeff do this? Did Jeff do that? She said she had to hate it. Um, and you know, we forget what it does to the families, the kids, the traumatized, the dad. You know, you've got lovely kids yourself, Chris. You know, what what do they feel when daddy goes away to war? Yeah, it makes you look back. You know, we're pretty selfish, weren't we, as Marines? You, you know, we, we, you saw it when you went out on the town. I mean, the, the fidelity wasn't a, you know, that wasn't a word. <laughs> oh, not, not everybody, of course. There were some guys doted on their bloody wives, but it, it's just, it's, it's just weird to look back and think it's just completely normal to know that, like, Smudge is married. He's got three kids back at the married. And yet here he is with some bird at, on at Lyddon High Range, you know, up when you're doing your shooting or something. And it was just that it, it was just the way it was. But you know, I I um I tell this story a lot and I, I can God, I can never get through it without getting emotional. I will try, but I joined up with Cam March's son. I call him Dan in all my memoirs because we did a lot of stuff as as youngsters. We 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 uh, we went on our first holiday together to New York and we got off with these two hairstylists from Dallas and took them up on the World Trade Center for dinner. It was just incredible time. But and he used to tell me in, in the Falklands, um, he'd watch like the six o'clock news or whatever it wasn't it? And then he'd have to watch the names of all those that were killed in battle that day yeah. or on the ships going up the screen. They used to, they used to, it probably sounds a bit strange to young people now, probably massively traumatic. And yes, it was. And, and um, he'd have to watch to see if his dad's name. God, I mean, he's a child for crying out loud. You know, he's a kid. He's got to watch the BBC News to find out if his dad's died that day. There and wasn't he... a con thing, Chris. There wasn't, you know, um, the whole routine was it, the padre and the duty officers to come round and knock on your door 
and say, um, sorry, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, I've got a story about that. I've got a few seconds. And that was um, when Tuff Ev Evans died, who was with my neighbour in Deal, um, very fond of Tuff, great rugby player, um, used to used to run a, a, um, a team of bouncers. I was one of his bouncers. Uh, used to go to Margate and sort of the odd evening to subsidise our poor pay and put our life on the line there as well. And um, so he, he was killed. And the duty officer, or, or everyone in the Murray Court knew the routine. They knew things that happened before anybody else knew because the rumour control used to fly around the Murray Quarter. And I was in, uh, I think I was living in Westfield in Plimpton. And um, duty officer comes up to our house and my missus in the, in, in the house and she knock on the door and uh, she looks at the window and she sees these two, two people. So she knows what that means. Jeff's dead or seriously injured. <clears throat> and uh, when he hit behind the settee, he wouldn't answer the door to him. He just couldn't do it. And uh, they opened the letterbox and, um, hello, hello, we, we, we know you're there. Um, can we talk to you? Wouldn't say nothing. I had the two, two kids with her. Wouldn't, wouldn't let them um, open and open the door. They were for like 15 minutes trying to get in. And they said, look, there's nothing to worry about. She just want to speak to you. So something in her head said, yeah. So she went to the door, said, what's, you know, uh, do you know where next door is? You know, <laughs> she's like, she put herself through all that trauma and all it was to ask where next door was. Just I know there's, there's, there's almost that identical scene in um, once was so, once, we were warriors once and young. It's the story of, of Colonel Hal Moore, who, who's one, in one of the biggest battles in Vietnam, or one of the early battles. He was air cavalry. And uh, he's Mel Gibson played him in, in that film. The book's incredible, folks. Anyone, you know, um, yeah, it's got a, a lot of character names that will be familiar. Rick Riscola, who, who died in a World Trade Center when it, when it down, went down. He was his... Um, I don't know, one of his sergeants or, or, or some such thing. But um, in that story, they had that exact scenario, how there was so the, the lack of humaneness when they were telling these wives that your, you know, your husband got killed today or yesterday or whatever it might be. And in the film, the way they portray it is this, uh, uh, this delivery guy rocks up at house. He's knocking on the door and the woman's like, no, you know, cause he's, I don't know. He's got a tie on. And she's like, no, no. And, and then finally someone's like, yeah. She's just, yeah. Can you tell me where this house is? And they're like, oh. and um, from that point on in, in that film, they, they set up this wives union so they could all support each other. And, and when the telegraph, guy came or the telegram guy came um he had to report to them so that then then the wives could then break it to the wife that their hus husband had um been injured or killed so it was the same for the guys on the ground chris um we used to have a sit rep come across in the evening um and they would announce on there and everybody would be on the radio we never all had radios then but you'll be listening to one it would say you know um, casualties 10 and they name them and you know you're listening for one of your mates or guy you're in training with, or you know oh god he's gone I had to got him landing craft got some you know I think call us on Johnson no I can't that's not possible um, it was just I don't know I don't know we did it but I'm honest we look back on it now it's a bloody miracle Mm. miracle oh there we go Jeff let's uh, I just want to close with yeah. talking about the valuable work you've done with Veterans United Against Suicide yeah um, I know our paths have crossed on some of the charity stunts that I've that I've done um, and uh, 
you know, people do struggle. I've tried to get mates. Well, I'm thinking of a particular mate of mine. I've tried to get on the podcast who's with four or five down there. He said, Chris can't do it. So after 40 years, I've just been diagnosed with PTSD. Yeah. I thought, so can't go to remembrance. Can't don't, don't think, don't, can't talk about my military medals. Don't even know where they are. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a big thing. We've also seen 20 years of uh, unpleasant conflict. Lots of service personnel have been taking their own lives. When we all, you know, we're all familiar with this scenario and, and even uh, the individuals in, involved. And so I, I want to talk about the work you've done and then also just send a message um, you know, a, a, a positive message to people out there. Okay. Um, so can you tell us a bit about Veterans United Against Suicide? Right. Okay. started Veterans United Against Suicide. Uh, I'm the founder. Um, I think it's me putting a bit back. You know, I've, I've should bare my soul a little bit today. But um, I also am a, a cancer survivor and... Um, I was struggling myself. Um, and a bloke called Big Dave um, died from Marine. And I looked at the messages of condolence from the court, and there were millions of them. Honestly, God, it was absolutely thousands of them. And he was the world's biggest man. His wife is stunning. He's got beautiful children, and he killed himself. And um, it really, it just, I felt like somebody smacked me in the face. Oh, I couldn't, couldn't get my head around it. Because people, all Marines don't commit suicide. My 22 years, no one, I don't know anybody that died of suicide. And uh, I, was, I was taken back. Um, so I did a bit of research, looked around, and I found it was happening all over the place. And... Uh, so I decided to set a group up um, that would build the awareness because people couldn't even say the word suicide. Mental health, we don't talk about it. It doesn't get said. And I said, why not? There's a lot of people suffering with mental health issues. It ain't going to go away. We're just ignoring it. So I set the group up. I challenged the government. I wrote to them. And I said, could you give me the figures for... Um, military serving and veterans deaths this year they said no we can't I said why not they said um, we haven't got them don't record them I said what do you mean you don't record them no so before that they insulted my intelligence by saying it's no different to any other group of people in the country I said well how can you work that out if you don't even keep the figures you can't, you can't say that you, it's on par with everybody else. The veterans is, is um, oh God knows how many veterans there are in this country, but since we've been recording the figures, five veterans die to every one serving, and that runs over a six-year period. It's almost identical. So we're losing that, that volume of people, and you're doing nothing about it. Mm. Why are you recording veteran suicides? Because they got the serving data. Um, but they haven't got the veterans. And they said, oh, we've never we've never collated it. So why don't you start collating it? No, I'm not doing that. So I said, right, I'll challenge you. I'll, I'll collate it. I put a team of three people together and we've collated it for six years and we've got the figures. Now, we don't get every single figure, but we do make sure that that person definitely died of suicide. The problem with suicide is it's emotional, it's emotive, and people don't want to talk about it. Families don't want to admit that their son, daughter passed um, because they're struggling with it themselves. And it, I've had to walk on eggshells for six years. I've been criticised for it, been murdered for it. The emotional 
playing I've been pro my team is unbelievable every day another one and, and people I know as well people from the core the army's been hit the hardest by, by miles so I kept it in the first year I think we lost this, this is off the top of my head because I've got figures in front of me but I've got them um, I was around about 86 86 people died government no it's no problem no problem doesn't exist us, us guys that serve and have served we all know there's a problem I don't know a bloke now that doesn't know a person that's committed suicide so what's the big what's happened in 20 years 30 years from none to 80 odd and the next next year it was the same virtually about four or five different then 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 we noticed something all of a sudden people started getting younger I spoke to Simon Marion, expert in the field. He said, Jeff, PTSD takes about eight years to manifest. He said, over the last two years, it's gone down to four. Um, you know, people, people like me, I'll be honest, I've been diagnosed PTSD over the last six, uh, last six months. And I've been a serious specialist. Uh, I've opened my heart out to them and they've told me, um, that what I've done over the last six years is opened a can of worms for me because people's sorrow has attached itself to me and it's opened my boxes that were securely secure. And now I'm an emotional mess. But we've done that over six years, voluntary, no pay, 24-7, helping people. People that are struggling, I get to be 100 people respond to this say yeah I was going to do it because of people like Veterans United Against Suicide who are highlighting it a great pain for themselves I feel there's a reason to carry on I've spoke to the families the wives some of them are quite bitter and twisted about it all blame themselves kids getting psychiatric help now because daddy's killing himself and all that and the government can't take it seriously. You know, when Johnny Mercer, no, Johnny Mercer's down your neck of the woods. When Johnny Mercer became Veterans Minister, I had great hopes that that was going to happen. But he found that his hands were tied and doors were closed, slammed in his face. And it never happened. And here we are, six years later, 350 men have died, not women. And actually, not just them 350, Chris. It's their families. It's the ripple effect. Their friends are broken. Now, uh, Jeff, let's remember this. This doesn't include the amount of people that have drunk themselves to death. Slow suicide. I put that under that, that bracket, Chris. You know, um, there's loads have done that. You know, they have drunk themselves to stupid because they, they can't they can't deal with the demons in their head unless they're drunk. Um, and we, God, we've all been there, haven't we? I don't think you can serve in the military and not get some sort of residual effect. Because even when you talk about it, if you've been in a battle, as soon as you start talking about it, you're there. The feelings that you had when you were there, you can relate to it. You can relate to it, Chris. Anyone's talking about anything to do with conflict, you can relate to that because you know how it feels, even if it's only an exercise. Even when you're on exercise, if you're taking it seriously, there's trauma. Because you know, I've had people come up to me in the middle of an exercise and go, you're dead. Mm, why? Well, you went you went there and they got a machine gun up there that took you out. You lie down, you're dead. You think, bloody hell. You know, so I, I did all that, Chris. Um, so I don't want any thanks for it. It's not about that. It's not about money. It's not about fame. It's about saving people. And we've saved lots. And, and that, that's the thing that I hold on to daily. Um, you know, my, my house not brilliant. Been told to pack it in, but I won't. The government have promised that next year they're going to stop recording figures. Let me say now, if anything that I've seen this government do, it will happen, but I, I would not trust one of those figures because someone's only going to turn around and say, oh, no, I didn't commit suicide. I got, handed, got, got a noose around his neck, but he was only pretending, that, you know, accidental death. 
You weren't going to do it. You climbed the ladders and the ladder slipped. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get sanitized figures, figures that don't, they don't, they don't represent what's really happening out there. And we are in the middle. Trust me, I know I've lived it every day for six years. We're in the middle of a suicide epidemic. And why we are is because it hasn't been dealt with. Yes, the core is brilliant, I think, Chris, to be fair. They've spent a lot of money in trying to get to the bottom of it. They built a center at CTC where the guys can go now. But until they have until they change things, and these are the things that need to change, it's simple, but they won't listen to me because I'm a nobody. They need to work on the transition of the guys coming out. They, they threw out thousands of people. We we in the core, we released hundreds of people that were mentally damaged through service with PTSD and other things, and we, we, we chucked them out. They went out at their most vulnerable. They had to find a house, a new place to live, a job. The kids had to find a new school. All that while suffering with PTSD, and we just thrown them out. No wonder people are committing suicide. Just and want just want to add something, mate. Is, 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 my, my trauma come from childhood. I had a, you know, can't, I, I don't really talk about it a lot, but it, it, I, I shouldn't have gone through that as a kid. I can tell you that. Um, and I know I speak for a lot of service personnel. We had very damaged upbringings and we saw the military as our, you know, the way to prove ourselves, the way out. And of course, when you, when you're a very damaged person and then in the prime years of your life, when you should be making sense of dealing with that trauma, but you're not because you're in a career, which really protects you. It puts a roof over your head. It pays your salary. It deals with your medicine. It feeds you 20, you know, 24, seven, three, six, five, you, you don't deal with it. And then suddenly when you come out and you lose that protective umbrella, and then things don't go, you know, you you have to interact with Civvy Street and that's not easy. You you have to learn things like if you have a problem with someone, you can't just take them around the back like we used to do and, and, and get beaten up in my case. But, <laughs> but you know, you, 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 you can't do that. And then so what do you do? You do what you've been taught for 20 years, which is have a drink. And then that becomes two drinks. And then the missus is like, honey, uh, the kids can't be seeing this shit. Um, we're going to grandma's. So you've lost your family. And and this is, you know, and and all that time you're struggling for that identity, which you've yeah. which has been put upon you for 20 years, 10 years, seven years, whatever it is, the identity that this is, I used to be somebody. And this is, it's not even, I'm the only person that talks about it, Jeff. I'm yeah. literally the only person uh, that I'm just trying to raise people's awareness is that it's not just about seeing your mates get battered in a conflict. It, it's that many of us were really damn. We, the, the recruiting ground for the military is from predominantly, I would say, quite damaged people. Yeah. And um, this needs to be recognised and there needs to be more 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 provision jeff what we'll do is we'll put all your links below this video so people can get hold of you, you. um you know don't for god's sake overload yourself because um you you, you know you uh, it starts with looking after our self life i think you know we if we can't look after self but i know what you're like and i know what i'm like <laughs> we do always go that we will always go that bit extra at our own expense um to people out there struggling, listen to this, especially at this this um, yeah. you know memorial anniversary. I, I would say, you know, we got to live every day for those oppos of ours that aren't here to live, yeah. right? What would they give to be sat here now, yeah. at drinking a cup of coffee, chatting with Jack? They'd love it. They they'd love it. You know and. and we got to live every day. We got to embrace life. You know, we we're still here, we're still firing, and we're still smashing it. The other thing is, is leave your identity in the past. Every day is a fresh day. It's like a, I like I don't know, like a TV screen. It just refreshes itself every every 
split second. It's a, it's a new screen. And that's what our life is. You know, if, if we seek our identity in the past, then that's where we're going to live. And you, you've got to shake, shake that off. Got to live for the present. This is what will people bandy terms like mindfulness around. And you've got to look after yourself and you've got to recognize that those habits, drink, drugs, whatever it might be. Ultimately, they just it's a downward spiral. And, um, you know, we need you to, to be going up. And the, the final thing I'll say is, um, you know, tough times don't don't last. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. There's millions upon millions of people that have, 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 have shown that and hang in there and grab someone that you can speak to and just be honest with them. Tell them everything. There's no, there's no uh, identity in this, you know, there's no macho in this. Just, you know, just, just start taking charge of it because I wouldn't change anything in my life, despite what I've told you. I've been through some, you know, horrendous stuff. I, I honestly wouldn't change a bit. I've been through chronic addiction, battered mental health. So, so bad. The doctors told my family I'd need to be put in an institution for the rest of my life. And I don't, Jeff, I, I genuinely, I wouldn't change any of it because no. once you crack it, and you realize it's all part of your journey. It's all part of your learning curve. It, it's allowed me to go on and create the best, best life ever. And if anyone doubts that, come and meet my boy. And Jeff, Jeff's met my boy at one of our reunions. It, 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 it's like a gift from God for me, you know. And if anyone ever says <laughs> I should have changed something in my, I, I wouldn't have him. And I wouldn't change that for the world, you know? So, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel, Jeff, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. It's exactly what you said, Chris. I mean, what I found is, you know, um, seek uh, help. Um, don't be afraid to, to ask for help. Uh, speak to people that you trust. You know, um, I, I started initially, um, initially for recently. What everybody should do is find three people they would want to go to battle with and put their name and their number under quick reaction force, QRF, in your phone. So when you're feeling the blues are in you, phone one of them and say, have you got five minutes? Phone all three of them if you have to and get them to shake you out of it. You know, um, it's so simple to do. You know, it's not going to cost anything. We're here to help you. Um we, we, we all feel down. We have bad days and we have good days. And like you said, Chris, you know, look at your family. Don't leave devastation behind when you go. You know, you truly want to see your kids grow up. You want to see a marriage. You want to see grandchildren and all the love and affection that family can give and your military family can give. Don't give up on it. Mm. It's not the answer. Never been the answer. Never will be the answer. You know, battle on. And that's it from me, Chris, really. Good man. Cheers, right. Jeff. Well, it's been an incredible chat. Um, okay. I uh, take my hat off to every, everybody that, um, that uh, made sacrifices in that conflict. Um, I can't say how proud it makes you to be a Royal Marine, but that's something that... <laughs> we we probably couldn't explain to people jeff no um thanks for coming on the show mate you've been incredible like i said we're friends we're going to put all jeff's links below um don't forget that we're going to have this falklands 40th memorial evening q a it's going to be i've no doubt it's going to get a bit emotional but it's generally going to be helps a light-hearted setting as possible will come. We'll all grab a drink. We're going to sit there. We're going to chat to these guys. Um, we're going to uh, hear their stories, and we're not going to le- we're not going to get this let this get lost to history. So stay tuned to my social media and and Jeff as well, and we'll update you on how you can get tickets. And uh, 
that just leaves me to say massive, massive thank you and big love to everybody at home. Please look after yourselves. Get out there today, smile at the sun, and uh, remember, you know, there's there's folks that can't do that anymore, and they they did it for our, yeah, you know, they did it for us. So, and, and thank you, Chris, as well. Thanks, thanks for everything. Thanks to all the people that are uh, not thanks to them, but people are struggling. You know, take some strength from it. It's been good topics today, and it helps talking about it. No two ways about it. Thanks, Chris.